Good evening, I'm Mark Beisel. And I'm Max Goldman. We're here tonight on beautiful Neck Point on Vancouver Island to discuss uh, the British Columbia's intertidal zone. We will also talk about the sea stars, the biology, and life history, as well as the role they play in the ecosystem here. The starfish of British Columbia have been going through a problem in the last year called starfish wasting disease. We're going to discuss how this affects the starfish as well as how the starfish's disappearance will affect the ecosystem as a whole. Let's go see if we can find some sea stars. The intertidal zone is the area where the land meets the ocean. As you can imagine, it is the area between the high tide and low tide mark. It is a very, very difficult place to live. That was good. The intertidal zone gets flooded one to two times daily. The movement of the tides affects temperature, salinity, moisture, pH level, dissolved oxygen, food supply, and predation. The bands visible behind me are all smaller suctions of the intertidal zone, definable by the species present. For example, the superlittoral zone, or the uppermost zone, is characterized by the presence of black algae and coralline algae. In BC's midlittoral zone, Pizaster ochreus, or purple starfish, acts as a keystone species and controls the abundance of sessile mussels that would otherwise colonize this entire area. Interestingly, however, mussels of the Pacific Northwest have developed an adaption that allows the species to survive above the range of the purple sea star. The mussels have the ability to close up tight while retaining seawater until the tide rising again, just like this one right here. This allows them to be out of water longer when there's a low tide. This distances them from the range of the predatory sea star which needs to stay underwater to walk. Sea stars belong to the family Echinodermata, along with sea urchins, sea cucumbers, and sand olives. Echino is Latin for spiny and derm for skin. Therefore, Echinodermata can be characterized by having spiny skin. Go. They will also possess five-point radial symmetry and are invertebrates. Sea stars are ferocious predators. They feed on anything they can find, including dead fish, bivalves, gastropods, even other stars. Starfish have what researchers call a uh, water vascular system. It's what it does, it's a system where they use water to do everything that they need, including breathing, feeding, and walking. If you come take a look at this star here, you'll actually be able to see it. We found this small purple sea star here on the rocks. If I flip them upside down, you can see all these tube feet. The water vascular system uses hydraulic water pressure in order to move all these tube feet. They are small projections of tissue. These tube feet can become very strong and allow the sea star to grip onto prey and rocks alike. In order to begin digestion, sea stars will actually push their stomachs out of their bodies through there and begin consuming their prey, sometimes even while they're still alive. Internally, sea stars have an organ that extends into each arm and secretes digestive juices. These also store digested food. These parts are called pyloric CK. Sea stars have the unique ability to regenerate limbs or parts of their body. While it may take up to a year for a limb to grow back, sea stars are one of the few organisms in the animal kingdom that can accomplish this feat. On rare occasions, an entire body can be regrown from just one limb. Sea stars are dioecious. This means that their species have both males and females, and each arm contains dew gonads. Sea stars are as well broadcast spawners. This means that they cast their gametes into the water column. All fertilization happens strictly by chance. Now once fertilized, the larvae are susceptible to predators because they're just floating around in the water. This is something that accounts for such a high predation rate on the sea stars. Now sea stars do not actually have a brain, but they do have a nerve ring around the central disc of their symmetry. At the end of each arm, a light sensitive eye spot is present. Some sea stars are attracted to light while others attempt to avoid light at all costs. Sea stars also contain a high concentration of neurosensory cells in their tube feet. These are used to sense touch and chemical as taste. Pycnopodia helianthoides. The root words in Latin meaning pycna means thick and podia means foot. Helia for sun and thoides for flower. That makes the species name thick-footed sunflower. The sunflower star is among the largest and fastest moving stars in the world. They can grow to become as large as one meter across. They are voracious predators with a diet of mussels, clams, snails, and even other sea stars. They have over 25 limbs with around 15,000 tube feet and can move up to one meter a minute while hunting. 
In 2010, they had a massive population spike. However, in the summer of 2013, they started disappearing altogether, with observations pointing towards a sea star wasting disease. Pizaster ocriacus, our friend the purple starfish over there, is also showing symptoms to the starfish wasting syndrome. However, unlike the sunflower star, are still surviving and thriving within the intertidal zone. According to a study at the University of California in Santa Cruz, the starfish wasting disease has been broken down into four categories of symptoms. Category 1. A single white lesion appears on the aboral side of the sea stars. However, this is not to get confused with the madreporite, an important part of the starfish's water vascular system. In Category 2, multiple lesions appear on the body. As well, the arms start to slowly deteriorate. On this photo, you can clearly see the tissue deteriorating and an arm starting to separate from the body. In Category 3, lesions appear in most of the body, and parts of or entire limbs will start to fall off. In category four, there are several deteriorations to the body. As the body deteriorates further and the tissue becomes soft, the starfish can no longer hold onto water. This is vital importance for the water vascular system. Now without being able to move or hunt, the starfish simply wastes away. In turn, this is how the wasting disease got its name. Dr. Marilev says his first observation of the epidemic was on September 1st, 2013. By September 10th, just 10 days from the first observation, millions were documented as dead. Areas where divers knew walls of Pycnopodia lived were now barren with just mush from the sea stars left over. This map shows areas containing infected starfish, as documented by rock intertidal users since 2014. The orange markers represent observations in the past year, Red markers represent high infection areas, and blue markers represent areas that are showing no new signs of the infection. Because Pizaster and Pycnopodia are such ferocious predators, they are a keystone species within the intertidal zone. The Pacific Northwest is world-renowned for its rock intertidal zone, and the Pizaster and Pycnopodias are major contributors in maintaining the biodiversity in that zone. There are several speculations on what has caused the wasting syndrome in the local starfish. It could be viral, could be bacterial, could be caused by ocean acidification. Either way, there is one noted connection. The disease travels with rising water temperatures. One guess has to do with climate change. The occurrence of marine diseases has shown a direct correlation with increasing water temperatures, as a constant rise in the ocean temperature creates a perfect environment for bacteria to grow. It is also known that ocean acidification is increasing due to the rising climate. A non-temperature related thought is overpopulation. This could be a regulatory response brought on by a population spike.